or lights. Okay, we're live. Okay. So thank you, everybody, and welcome to another exciting talk. Today we have Bill Freeman, and Bill is one of my favorite researchers in the world, and I have many researchers that I like. So being one of my favorite ones is no small feat. Um, Bill is the uh, Thomas and Gerd Perkins Professor of Electrical Engineering at Computer Science at MIT and a member of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, also known as CISEL, there at MIT. Since 2015, he has also been a research manager in Google Research in Cambridge, in Massachusetts. He received outstanding paper awards at computer vision and machine learning conferences in 1997, 2006, 9, 12, and 19, and test of time awards for papers from 1990, 95, and 2005. Those are awards that you get when your papers become seminal. He shared the 2020 Breakthrough Prize in Physics for a consulting role with the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, which, as you know, reconstructed the first image of a black hole. In 2019, he received the PAMI Distinguished uh, Researcher Award, which is the highest award in computer vision, and was also elected to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering in 2021. So thanks, Bill for being here. It's an honor and looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, just one more thing. Sorry, Bill. Uh, as usual, for the people that, that came late, feel free to unmute the mic for questions. Bill is fine with that. Or you can also write in the chat and we will monitor the chat and we will read the questions for you if you don't want to speak yourselves. And there will be a Q&A session at, at the end as well. OK, Bill, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Diego. Um, it's uh, about, gee, about 10 or 8 years ago, I, I visited Zaragoza and uh, had a wonderful time. It was a great host. And I'm glad to be back again. I'm sorry it's virtual instead of in person, but uh, I'll come in person in the future. Um, so this talk is, uh, is a kind of a strange one. It's about a project that hasn't worked yet. Um, so why am I talking about it? Well, because I love it, and also because uh, it actually has been like a muse, like an inspiration for me that leads to a number of other projects that, that some have worked out sometimes. So I want to tell you about the project and about ways that it, places that it's led, led me and, my, and, our, and our research team. Um, and as I said, uh, so I, I work at both Google and at MIT, but this is an MIT project. Um, and I, I always have trouble deciding, actually, whether I like working in academia better or in industry better. But the thing I know for sure is that the best job is to be on sabbatical in academia. That's like the perfect job because you get this whole year off and nothing's expected of you. But you know it'll end. It's not like being without a job. You, you know it'll end soon. So it's just a wonderful time to think. So in 2008, I was on sabbatical with that ideal job. And I spent most of the sabbatical looking around at everything, asking, can I make a camera out of that? Can I make a camera out of that? Can I make a camera out of that? And, um, and so I looked up at the moon and I said, can I make a camera out of that? And somehow that question really just stuck with me like a virus kind of. It just, uh, I, I can't let go of that. And I think it would just be really cool to uh, use a telescope from the Earth look at the moon, look at the details of the illumination by the Earth on the moon, and pull out a picture of the Earth. OK, so first of all, what's going on? Why are we, you know, what, what's up with that? Well, if you look at a, a crescent moon, you'll see, uh, you'll see this very bright part there at the, the, the bottom in this image. And then you'll also see a, a sort of a faint picture of the moon. And you might ask, well, what's that lit up by? Well, that's lit up by the re reflected light from the Earth. So. Um, let's see. Ah, can you see my pointer? I don't see my pointer. Not a good sign. Oh, well. Okay, so the sun uh, lights up the Earth, and then the moon is lit up really in three different ways. 
or has three different levels of illumination on it. So first is direct light from the sun. That's in that yellow crescent on the moon picture. And then you have this faint light that's earth shine. It light, it's light that comes from the sun to the earth, reflects off the earth, and then bounces to the moon, and then bounces back to your eye at the earth. Um, and that's the that's what we want to, that's what we want to take advantage of to try to make a picture of what the earth looks like from the moon and then in addition there's that third part that little sliver of blackness uh, on the moon and that's part that's of the moon that's not lit up either by the direct sunshine or by the indirect earth shine and that's uh, just lit up by stars but we, we can't really see light coming from there um, so now first of all to answer the the very first question you know, why do we need to do this? Um, we already have pictures of the Earth from space. We have satellite images. And yes, that's true. But so it's really for, for two reasons that I want to do this. One, I just think it would be really neat. It's kind of like a conceptual art project. You get this image. And what's not so important, what's so important is not really the image itself, but how you got the image, the fact that it came from, from just, just photographing uh, the moon in, from your backyard. And then secondly, so, so one is just the fact that it'd be neat. That's why I bother. The second reason to bother is that it would be really cool for amateur astronomers to be able to photograph the Earth. It's like adding another planet to the list of planets you can photograph as an amateur astronomer. You know, like now you can go in your backyard and take pictures of Saturn and Jupiter and Mars. So this would let you take a picture of the Earth. And that would be so neat. I think people would really get excited about it. Um, and just as a just as a as a pointer in that direction, you know, when the the NASA when the Apollo astronauts took this this famous famous picture that's shown in the bottom right there, of um, of the Earth rise over the Moon, it it became a really this global sensation. It was really it it helped people on the Earth get a get a sense of themselves in in you know in in our solar system, uh, and it. Uh, is credited with kind of just awakening a lot of awakening a lot of interest in uh, ecology in, in, to a small extent, and we can't hope for that kind of impact, but we just hope for something in that direction that it would help people think about the Earth in space and about uh, about computational imaging in general. Actually, so so then so that's the goal. Then we want to. Uh, use equipment that an amateur astronomer can put in their backyard and we want to try to make a picture of the earth from space that's our goal now i want to tell you why it's a hard problem uh I mean, there are a number of reasons but but one is just the geometry of it so um on the slide it talks about a quarter so if the earth is the size of a quarter and then for this talk I, i'm i'm changing it i have a a, a 50 cent euro uh, um, piece here, which is just the same size as the quarter. So this is the size of the Earth. And then in this relative size, the moon would be the size of a pea. So this is the relative size. Now, you want to be on the Earth and look at illumination changes on the moon that were caused by where the light ray came from on the Earth. And then, then the, the question is, how far apart are these things? Well, it turns out that to scale, uh, if a P is the size of the moon, then the, the P is arm's length away from the 50 cent piece. And that's the relative geometry of the Earth and the moon. So you want to look at some change to the reflected light from the moon, that's the Earth shine that's reflecting from the Earth. And there should be some difference in that light, whether as to whether a light ray came from one side of this 50 cent piece or from the other side of it. That should somehow change what the reflected light from the P looks like. And so you can see that the angles involved are going to be very small. And it's going to be a, a, a really a question of the details as to whether this can work or not. And so, so what are the, you know, the details that we have access to? How, how, uh, fine resolution image can we make of the moon? So the moon from, from the Earth is about half a degree in size, and, and that's um, 1,800 arc seconds. So, um, 
an arc minute is 1 60th of a degree, an arc second is 1 60th of an arc minute. Um, and so what's the resolution that we can look at the moon with from the Earth? So I have these two sets of um, resolutions available. The top one, the top two are, are things you can expect to get with a backyard telescope. So under really good viewing with a five inch diameter telescope, you might get one, one arc second resolution. And then if you use uh, a technique called lucky imaging, where you take many different photographs and, and uh, search for the ones where the atmosphere happened to be quiet for that moment of the photograph and just average over those lucky images, then you can get maybe twice or a little bit more than twice the resolution. So you, you might be able to get up to half an arc second of resolution. And I should mention that, you know, there's, there's two limiting factors to the resolution. One is the size of the telescope. And so you have to use a, a bigger telescope to get the half arc second resolution, say a 10 inch diameter telescope. And then the second limiting factor is turbulence in the atmosphere. And so you have to use this lucky imaging method to, to try to uh, bypass the limitations from a turbulent atmosphere. That's with a backyard telescope. With a professional telescope, you can do better because they have better techniques to um, account for turbulence in the atmosphere and they have much larger telescopes. So you might be able to get down to 0.2 or even 0.1 arc seconds of resolution if you use a professional telescope. Um, okay, so I've, I've worked on, uh, or my lab, I, I've worked on three, three methods to approach this problem. Uh, measuring diffuse reflections from the moon. That's one, I'll talk, talk about that. And then observing fuzzy boundaries of cast shadows of Earth shine on the moon. And then a third one uh, I'm sort of in process with is measuring specular reflections of modulations within sunlight. Uh, and that relates to work that Diego's done. Um, so let's talk about the first one, measuring diffuse reflections. So here, here we're going to model the moon as a perfectly smooth surface. And um, if, if, uh, if you then, and you just look at the amount of light reflected back from the Earth shine, um, there, you can have different roughness, assumed roughness characteristics of the moon. If you have a so-called Lambertian surface, which uh, scatters light equally in all directions, um, then it, you'd get the image on, shown on the left. This is from a paper by Nair and Owen. Um, but actually, the moon's even rougher than that, and there's a lot of backscatter, so you get an image more like the, the one on the right within the blue rectangle. Um, and uh, I just these are the only slides that have any math in them, but I just want to just mention that the approach we're taking, we're using uh, just a Gaussian approach, so it's the simplest possible thing. and um, it's, it's not the most powerful method, but it's, it's the easiest to understand. And so that's why we use it. So we want to, um, sorry, they don't have a pointer available here, but anyway, um, we want to reconstruct an image of the earth. We'll call that X based on lunar observations. We'll call that Y. And by Bayes rule, that's going to be a product of two terms, the so-called likelihood term, which is how probable the, moon observations you saw were given any particular image of the Earth, and then multiply that by the prior probability of that particular image of the Earth. And then uh, the, the beauty of this problem is it's all linear. So if you take the image of the Earth, x, and you rasterize it into a vector, um, you can then find the so-called rendering matrix A, which you multiply that vector by to give you the observations that you would see on the moon. And then uh, under the assumption of, of um, Gaussian noise, then your so-called likelihood term is just an exponential in uh, what you saw minus what you expected to see or y minus ax squared. So um, how, do these, how do the reflectance properties of the moon play into this? Um, so uh, you see on the far right there, the kind of geometry of the earth and the moon um, you're sit we're sitting there in the, in the dark part of the Earth, because it's nighttime where we are. We have our telescope out, and we're looking at li light rays that, that uh, went from the Earth to the Moon, and then reflected from the Moon's surface back to our telescope. And then what we, what we want to do is to be able to distinguish by, by measuring the reflected ray, 
whether the incident ray came from, say, that position on the Earth or from some other position there. And so we want to look and see if we change the place where the light came from on the Earth, how much is it going to change what we receive back when we look at the moon. And so you can look at the so-called BRDF, the bidirectional reflectance distribution function, and um, you can plot out for a given reflected light ray direction, how much does the uh, intensity depend on where the ray came from on the Earth. And so there are different reflectance models. The Lambertian is the one we talked about. The, uh, and then the one I'm labeling Minair is a much more realistic model of the moon, which shows how very rough it is. So my point here, here is that you can see from this plot that we're going to have to look just at the very edge of the moon because we want to have a reflectance function that we want to use the part of the reflectance function where a small variation in the angle that the ray came from, here, like whether which part of the Earth it came from, where a small variation there is going to make a measurable difference in the reflected light coming from the moon. And you can see from these reflectance plots that the only place where that's going to happen is where the, the um, reflected light ray is just around 90 degrees, just almost perpendicular to the normal uh, surface normal of the moon, which, is, which means right near the edge of the moon when you're looking at the moon from the Earth. So those are the parts where we have any hope of seeing a, a signal that lets us tease out how much intensity is coming from what part of the Earth or from another part of the Earth. So we're going to take samples right near the moon's so-called limb, as astronomers call it, or the edge, as we call it normally. And um, so here you see the curvature of the moon, three different en enlargements of it. And here you can see where we're going to sample to make our measurements of the moon's reflected intensity. And what's shown here is half an arc second radially radial sampling. And, and then here, um, I've shown the, the predicted um, light transport matrix that takes you from, so he, here's how to read this, this image. What we're going to do conceptually is, is light up a single point of light somewhere on the Earth in the sort of raster scan fashion. And I've made colored bars there over this picture of the Earth to show where the raster is. And then for each one of those points where we light up a single pixel, we're going to measure what the reflected light from the moon would be. And we're going to measure it right around the edge of the moon in a series of um, uh, angular variations and then moving slightly in radially from each line. So there you see the color code. You see in the matrix, according to, corresponding to each color, where we're plotting the resulting reflected uh, intensity. So, so, so you, uh, you assume a particular reflectance function for the moon and go through this calculation, and you can calculate how much for a given, if you turn on a single pixel on the Earth, how much light you'll measure from any given point on the moon along the edge where the, where the signal is going to matter most for pulling out the image of the Earth. And you get this uh, transport matrix shown there. Um, OK, so that's the likelihood term in this Bayesian equation. Then the second term we have to work with is the prior model for what Earth images look like. Um, at the very end, I'll, I'll describe a more, much more powerful model. But here, we're just going to assume that um, images of the Earth looks like, look like any other images that we might see. So you can take uh, a, an image from a photograph and cut it into the um, silhouette that you expect to see from the Earth. And we'll use that as our prior model for our Earth image. Um, it turns out, rather than a pixel basis, it's actually a little bit easier to use um, a, a singular value decomposition of all those images and, and get a set of, uh, use, it's a different linear combination of pixels. We can get a set of modes. And it's very similar to a Fourier transform. We have the low frequencies on the left and then higher and higher frequencies. Um, and um, you can, if you assume that everything is, uh, each mode is independent, then you, and you can, um, by measuring the Earth Im the images from the Earth, you can get a, use this, exploit the so-called 1 over f power spectrum of most, most images you see to come up with a, uh, a Gaussian model that each one of these is an independent Gauss, the 
amplitude of each one of these modes is an independent Gaussian random variable. And um, then you can have a function which generates random images of your, of your simulation of the Earth. And, and here's what some of those are at the bottom. So these are random draws from our prior. So these don't obviously don't really look very much like the Earth, but it's a nice, simple um, mathematical model for images. And what's really nice is it lets, it lets us get an analytic solution for what the reconstruction should look like. So here we're back with our next to the last math equation. Um, uh, we have the posterior probability is the product of our likelihood and our prior. Because everything's Gaussian in this model, you can solve this analytically for what the Gaussian is that you get for the, for the, um, the probability of any given Earth image given the lunar observations uh, using a sort of a matrix version of completing the square. And this is the result for the uh, mean estimated Earth image as a function of why the observations of the intensities you make just around the edge of the moon. It's uh, multiplying by this, it's just a linear function of those observations and you multiply it by this matrix that depends on the rendering, on your no assumptions about noise and your assumptions about the Earth probabilities. So that's the, that's the power you get from this Gaussian model. And, um, and so here, let's, let's watch it being used in practice. Um, so we have, uh, say, the first eight normal modes of the moon's intensity. So we're going to construct a moon as a linear combination of these eight images shown here. And we get the amplitude of each one of these eight first normal modes by looking at the moon measuring the intensity along just along the edge and um, along several different places just in from the edge there. So for example, the red, green, blue, and purple and violet curves. And then for each one of the modes, we have a multiplier that we use to multiply by your intensity measurements to come up with the coefficient that you, that you have reconstructed for that particular mode of the Earth. So for example, looking at mode number one, you can see that uh, we first take the outermost intensities that you measure along the moon and multiply them by the coefficients shown there above the red bar uh, where it says mode one. And then you go step in just a little bit from the edge of the moon and multiply the intensities you see there by the coefficients that are plotted here in the green above the green bar where it says mode one and so forth. And then you take all those products and add them all up and you get a number. And that number is the amplitude of mode one shown there on the earth. And you do that for all the modes and you come up with a reconstructed earth image based on observations of the moon. Pretty cool. It all sounds good. We're almost there. And there's just one thing it was that for realistic models of the um, observations and realistic models of the noise, you don't get the information that you want. You only get about eight modes worth of data from this. So you were showing a plot now of the, um, the green is the true amplitude of the modes of some particular Earth image. And the red are the estimated amplitudes made from looking at the moon. Now you know that you'll notice that the, the very, the zero, the very first mode, it totally gets wrong because we're assuming zero mean, but that's, um, that's a detail. We can just add that, add that in later. But you'll notice it gets pretty close to a good estimate. So the, the red curves and the green curves in the plot on the left agree with each other pretty well up till about mode eight. And then the red curve, which is the estimate, kind of gives up. And it says, well, I, don't, I can't see what's going on here. I, I'm going to guess zero for the rest of the way. And um, this, this beautiful Gaussian model kind of tells you that you should do that because it also um, gives you a prediction of what the error in your estimate is. And you can see that on the right there, um, the, the estimate of each mode gets a little bit worse. And then, and then it finally says, oh, I give up. I think everything is zero. And it, uh, it, it, it tells you to estimate zero. And um, so we only have about eight modes worth of image data that we can construct under these reasonable assumptions. And so here's what that looks like visually. So the bottom left is like a, a simulated actual image of the Earth. And then the 
top left shows that image projected onto the first three, first 30 modes, this um, lower dimensional representation of the Earth image. We'd love to be able to reconstruct that. That would be total success if we could get that. But if you assume 0.1% um, observation noise, which is you know, pretty good, actually, pretty noise-free image, um, the, and reasonable resolution limits, then really the best you get is the image, the middle image shown there. And if you assume even less noise, it doesn't help you that much for this case. This is for looking at it with half an arc second resolution, which is really kind of the best you can expect someone to get from their backyard telescope. So it's not, we haven't had success here. If you, if you allow a professional astronomer to, to take the images with 0.1 arc seconds of resolution, then you can get you know, reasonable looking reconstructions. You, maybe you can see continents, maybe you can see global uh, weather patterns uh, in resolution of the Earth at the images, at images of the Earth at resolution shown here, like the middle and the right images of the top row. So, so we haven't found success there uh, with this method number one. Um, it's, about a, it's about a factor of five or 10 off in the resolution. If we could just get a factor of five or 10 better resolution, this could work, but it, it doesn't work for amateur astronomers. But I should point out that, okay, what's the spin-off from this? How did this help us anyway? Well, so I spent all this time really thinking about this problem and, and working it through. And then um, there was a, uh, a, a, a grant program that was announced that was looking at non-line of sight imaging. And um, it was uh, by DARPA and they were looking for proposals. And so I just proposed exactly what I had done with the moon and say, well, let's assume, so they're looking at uh, how you can make an image of something without being able to see it directly, but just seeing light bounce off of it, off of something else. So I said, well, let's assume we have a sphere in the room and we get to look at the sphere. So it's all the same equations, all the same math that I worked out for the moon. We just applied it uh, in, in, in an interior room scene and did the same reconstructions uh, and came up with little simulations of what you might see in a conference room uh, if you were allowed to look at a rough sphere somewhere uh, out of, uh, even though you couldn't see inside the room. So, so that was spin-off number one for me was getting involved in this non-line of sight imaging uh, big funding team. Okay, uh, are there questions about that before I move on to uh, method number two? There is nothing in the chat, but if you guys want to um, ask questions. I was okay. going to ask, so yeah, go ahead. So, so no, sorry. David. OK. Um, I think that I need to uh, review all the content because it's really exciting. And it's really exciting how you explained that it was uh, your passion and everything. Uh, but it, it's kind of difficult as it is the first time we see this kind of stuff. Uh, I was wondering if you thought or if there is uh, any idea of doing the same with different uh, bodies in the space? Like, is it mm. possible with bigger bodies or bigger reflections or something like that? Or are they maybe too far from each other, simply? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I've, I've, I've thought about that myself. Um, uh... I feel like the the moon is is sort of the um, it's an unusual situation where the only thing lighting up the dark part of the moon is the Earth, and so that's a um, I I was hard hard pressed to find other situations in astronomy where you might have that same kind of viewing condition, but but I agree it's um, you know anyway I haven't I haven't thought of conditions where it would also be useful in other settings, but um, I agree with you. It'd be exciting to be able to apply this as a another way to look at uh, celestial bodies. Thanks, Diego. Did you have something you want to ask? Yeah, maybe it also completes David's uh, question because um, one of the big assumptions you make is the uh, round shape of the moon, and I was thinking of asteroids or any other shape. So then I guess it's a, a more complex op optimization. Uh, have you looked into that, relaxing some of the assumptions, or or is the problem complex enough as it is? 
Yeah, um, that's that's a great point. Um, yeah, I feel it is. Um, right, I feel I need to get this working first. But um, but you know, so possibly you could look at the far side of a planet by by looking at the reflections from the a moon of that planet or or an asteroid or something. Um, it's possible, and yes, you would have to take into account the the, the more complicated shape of the the object. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anything, Julio, from your side, YouTube? No, there's nothing on YouTube. Okay. okay, so I guess we can continue. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So method number two um, is does take into account uh, non-spherical aspects of the moon, and it's um, the idea is to look at uh, fuzzy boundaries of cast shadows. So let me show you what I mean by that. So this is all about craters, actually. So suppose we have a crater in the moon shown by this uh, idealization shown at the left. And if you look at the crater closely, it's, again, on, on the Earth shine illuminated part of the moon, there's going to be a, uh, the Earth is going to cast a shadow of the near side of the crater onto the far side of the crater. And so suppose you're sitting in the crater on the moon, looking back at the Earth. Um, when you're at position number A, you see a full picture of the Earth. So on the left shows where you are on the crater, and then on the right it, uh, shows conceptually where the front wall of the crater is relative to the picture of the Earth. So at A, the Earth is above the, the front wall of the crater, and you see the whole thing. And so when you're looking at point A from the Earth, you see it in full earth shine, so it's got full illumination. Now suppose you're at point B, sitting, looking back at the earth, then it, the earth is just above the edge of the crater wall. And so on the right side, you can see the earth just, the, the full earth is just touching the, the front wall of the crater there. And then by the time you get to position C inside the crater, then looking back at the earth, the front wall of the crater cuts through half of the Earth. And so the intensity that illuminates point C is only the sum of all the reflected intensities on the Earth from the half part going up. And it doesn't take into account the intensities from the middle part going down. And again, at point D, you'll see just the intensities coming from the very tip of the Earth. So what this is telling you is that if you look at the intensities that you see in that cast shadow at looking from the earth it points a b c d e the brightnesses there tell you what the partial integrals over the earth's intensities are so uh in other words at point c it tells you the integral of all the intensities on the earth from the halfway point up and point d tells you the integral of all the intensities from just the very tip up to the top and so um so you can, so it gives you uh, a, a, a view of partial sums of the Earth's intensities. That's from one crater. But then, if okay, and then sorry, this is a, a, the same story, but from a different point of view. Here we're looking at the same story, showing uh, from a side view. You see the front wall of the crater in the left image, uh, and then on the, you see where you are on the left side. You're in the far side of the crater. It's it's your picture of the Earth is occluded by the front wall of the crater. And again, uh, on the right side, you see these images that you would look at if you were inside the crater looking out. So so any given crater gives you these, this uh, set of partial intensities of, of um, slices of the Earth going up. And then, but you get to look at craters at different orientations around the moon. And that gives you um, then these many different partial sums by looking at those intensities in the fuzzy boundaries of the cast shadows you're allowed to see all these partial sums of um, the earth's intensities in uh, from all these half plane croppings of the earth's image and then you have like a sudoku problem uh, you know if you that you say the sum of all these intensities is this number and then some of all these intensities is this number some of all these intensities is this number do it for you know maybe 100 different slicings of the earth and then you can 
solve that problem using linear algebra and pull out what the Earth image looks like. So that's the plan. Now, it relies on how big are the craters. So if you have a really big crater, that's really good because then this, this cast shadow has a really long throw distance. And so the fuzzy boundary is going to be as big as possible the farther it travels from the front wall to the back wall. And if you have a huge crater, then that'll stretch out the fuzzy boundary and make it something that, that you can measure in uh, telescope observations from the Earth. So then the name of the game is, how big are the craters just around the edge of the moon where this effect is going to be the largest? And you want to find, and so you can look at a map and say there, you know, some are 50 kilometers, there's some that are 100 and 150 kilometers and so forth. So I haven't gone through it in detail, but I've done calculations. If we assume that all, the average of the size of the craters will be 50 kilometers, or if you assume that the average size will be 100 kilometers. And here's the result of the simulated, this is all simulated, uh, reconstructions. So here we have uh, a ground truth image on the left, and then we have two columns for backyard telescope resolution in the middle, and then professional telescope resolution on the right. And then the top row is 50 kilometer cast shadows. And then the bottom row is 100 kilometer cast shadows. So the very best you do is if you're allowed to look at this thing with really high resolution with a really long cast shadow. So that's the bottom right image. And that gives you something on the order of um, 16 by 16 resolution image of the Earth, which would just be great. I'd be so happy if we could get that. But it's a little bit optimistic on the, the size of the craters near the edge of the moon, although I haven't, haven't verified it for sure, but I think it's a little optimistic. And it's quite optimistic regarding the resolution that you're allowed to look at the moon with. It, it says 0.1 arc seconds. If we, in the, in the uh, backyard telescope size, I've even allowed it to go a little bit beyond the 0.5 arc seconds down to say 0.3 arc seconds. That's, a, that's like a super astronomer, super backyard astronomer. But even the very best you get, assuming very long, large craters at the edge of the moon is this kind of five by five pixel image of the Earth uh, at the, um, the bottom row of the middle column there. So, um, so again, it's, it's disappointing. If, if we could just get about the factor of five better resolution images of the moon from the Earth, then we could really do, you know, we could get that bottom right image. Um, but, we're, but with what we have under the constraints of a backyard astronomer, can't quite get it. Okay, so that's failure number two, but let's talk about spin-off number two. Um, this led, this, you know, thinking about these fuzzy boundaries of cast shadows led to this whole research direction that uh, my, my team and our collaborators have explored for um, non-line of sight imaging. Uh, we developed something we call the corner camera. And, and I'm told that uh, Katie Bauman was your first speaker. Uh, she's my former student. So when she was a graduate student with me, she worked on this uh, corner camera that I'm about to tell you about. Um, so suppose you have, uh, so, so suppose there's a person just idealized as a cylinder here. Um, they're around the corner, you can't see them, but you're allowed to look at the ground that can, where, where the ground sees both you and it sees the person around the corner. Um, interestingly, the person there, that cylinder C, the fact that they're there causes a small change in the intensity that is reflected from the ground. And, and, and that's, um, that's got a sharp boundary to it, whether the influence is there or not there, right at the, in the area labeled two here in this plot, just at the where the um, where the corner of the vertical wall intersects the line of sight to the ground from the cylinder, um, and so if, and you could imagine if 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 this person's C were a flashlight, they would sh sh make this shadow boundary from the corner onto the ground, 
Well, they're not a flashlight, but they do reflect some amount of light, and it changes the intensity on the ground uh, based on whether or not the person is standing there. So here's the quiz question for you all. Uh, so under normal circumstances, by what, what ballpark uh, order of magnitude does a person standing around the corner, how much do they change the intensity that's reflected from the ground when you look at the ground? Uh, um, so you might think about this. It's, it's not gonna be a factor of two change. You don't see these big shadows of people as they walk around the corner. Anyway, if, if anyone wants to gather, so what I'm looking for is a fraction, like one part in 10 to the something. I'm going to just go ahead and guess one in 20 to break the ice. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the engagement. <laughs> so, so um, you know, obviously, it really depends on all the details that I haven't told you here. But, but just for typical configurations, uh, we can measure it's about one part in a, in a thousand. So, the, so if you're you're staring at a camera in in like on the ground there, and a person moves into place or moves out of the way, that that difference is going to change the brightness on the ground by about a factor of one in a thousand. Now, one in a thousand is just a wonderful number <laughs> because it's invisible to the human eye. You can't see that intensity difference, but it's perfectly measurable by averaging over pixels on the ground with a conventional camera. So this is something you can pull out with a conventional web camera or camera that you can't see by eye, and it it, it tells you about what's around the corner. So um, and you can use it outdoors. It's it's really pretty robust. So here's uh, here's a part of the MIT campus, and uh, there's a nice corner there right in the middle of the image. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk down and we're going to stare at the ground, and we're just by staring at the ground, we're going to try to figure out what's going on around the corner. So there's the there's our camera looking at the ground, and then we're gonna have people move around the corner. And here's Katie Bauman again. So there they're moving around the corner. That's they're not within view of the camera. This there, the camera is just off to the left of this uh, of the photograph here. And let me show you the camera image. This is the world's most boring video. So here, the, the left image, it's a video that's playing. You can see it's playing. There's the video. <laughs> world's most boring video. Ah, this I can see it now. It's the most boring video. There's no intensity changes that you can see by eye there. But in reality, their moving off around here causes um, little shadows to be cast from the corner onto the ground, these invisible shadows, one part in a thousand changes. And um, if you kind of work it through, these shadows, uh, the, the, what you see on the ground really is an integral of all the light from all around up until the corner, and then it stops integrating at the corner of the things that are on the street. And so the way you read out from an integrator response is by differentiating. And if you, it turns out if you apply this mask to, to the ground pixel intensities here, you'll pull out a one-dimensional image of what's going on around the corner. Um, another way to think of it is if you sit here at this point on the ground and you you ask, what can I see? You're on the ground here, and you've got a neighbor who's right to your right. If you want to know what's in the direction right there toward the corner, you want to ask, what can my neighbor see that I can't see? And that tells you what intensities are going on right there in that line direction. And that's what this uh, little, um, sorry, that's what this operator tells you about. This is yellow means positive and blue means and dark blue means negative. Ah, sorry, one more time. Yeah. So it's asking 
what's visible from this angle that's not visible from this angle that tells you what's off in that direction. The result is you can pull out as a function of angle a one-dimensional video of what's going on around the corner. And here's one of those videos. So the, the, the top axis is space or angle from the corner, and the vertical axis is time. And this trace here is reconstructed from the video that I showed you before. And so um, because the occluder is just this vertical structure, it doesn't give you any information about what's going on as a function of height. It just tells you about what's going on as a function of angle. So you get a 1D video, and you might argue, what's the point of having a 1D video? Well, it tells you something about what's around, but um, it's, you, you, so even though it's just a 1D video, you can tell you know, how many people are there around the corner. So you can see from this trace, there's just one person around the corner. And you can see you know, where they move quickly, where they move slowly. Um, and here's a trace showing two people moving around the corner. And you can see that there are two from that. So, so what's so nice about this, these corners, they're just ubiquitous in the world. They're everywhere in the world. And, and you, can, you can see what's around the corner by looking down on the ground and ma making these measurements. So we think that's very exciting. And um, I'll skip this part. So uh, here are other examples of it. Let's see. Here's, here's just a real contrived example just to make it all easy. Um, if we have a bright light and, and have uh, Katie and uh, an undergrad, um, Vicky, walking around, you can see the colors that they're wearing, actually. Um, but, but it's more general than that. We don't need the bright light. We can get, uh, we get a worse image, but we can still get an image. You can do it um, outdoors there. You know, again, another thing about outdoors, again, here at the bottom left, this is the world's most boring video. This is the data, that, this is our input data. And here's them. We had to blur their images to maintain anonymity for the conference paper submission. Um, and then here's the, the readout of, of where, where the person is moving as a function of angle around the corner. Um, so what might you use this for? Well, you could imagine using it outdoors um, you know, the sort of the quintessential place where you'd want to use it is maybe you could use it in a car looking around the corner to make sure some child wasn't going to jump out in front of you. So to check whether this worked with kids, we borrowed a child. <laughs> this is the daughter of a faculty member. Um, and uh, just to see if it worked in that case. So here she is walking around. And this is the recovered trace. She's she has um, she's much smaller than the graduate students. So there's a, the image is a little noisier but we still can recover the image of her moving around and running, even though she's around the corner. Um, so I should point out a limitation of this. Because you're looking at the ground and you don't know a priori what, what, what the pattern of dirt and other variations is on the ground, we had to subtract away a temporal average image. We had subtracted away a mean image over the video. So this, this thing can only look at uh, things that move. So I call it T-Rex vision because uh, in Jurassic Park, that was the story with the T-Rex that it, it couldn't see you if you didn't move. So we also can't see around the corner if they don't move. But if they do move, we can see them. And this led to a whole set of work that, uh, from our group and collaborators on uh, inferring light fields from cast shadows. So my point here is, even though the moon thing hasn't yet worked out, it has led to nice research directions for the team. OK. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry. If I can, I, can I ask a question? Please. Yeah, so up until this point, uh, for the non line of sight uh, imaging, you have been using only the ambient light that's coming from, in this case, the sun. Right. Yes, but yes. My question was if you thought about any experiments uh, where you were the one that moved the light source, like pointing with a with a lantern or with a light bulb at the at the corner, and if you move the the light source, maybe you can detect the moving objects without the objects that themselves uh, being the one who move. Yes. No. I um I I think that's a great idea, and uh so. 
yes, we um, we sort of cat divide the non line of sight imaging world into passive and active methods. And what you're describing is a, is a, an element of the active methods. Um, and there's been a lot of exploration of that, some by our team at MIT and others by other teams in the non non line of sight imaging world. So that that's a very powerful method. Um, we just uh, I'm just personally more interested in seeing what you can do with purely passive methods, but but an active method. So that the uh, yeah the active method certainly uh, lets you do more. That's true. Um, okay. Now, I, I, I actually have another question. If yeah. going back to the craters, uh, the beginning of your second method, mm -hmm. because of the concave shape, you would assume there's a lot of interreflections and global illumination going on mm -hmm. that may or may not be negligible, but it seems to break your assumption of linearity. When um, okay, that's a great point. Um, I would hope those would be second order effects, but um, and, and I can't even measure the first order effects yet. <laughs> 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 but but you're right. It would it would it would make it a nonlinear problem. Yes. If, right. if I can add to Diego's question, uh, uh, so the moon has a very low albedo, so probably the the interreflections in the in the moon with itself in the crater will be won't be that that noticeable. That's a good thing of the moon. It actually has a very low albedo, so it reflects not that much light. But there's also very little interreflections between them because the LD is very low. So yeah, yeah. Thanks. I was imagining that, but I was thinking maybe they are low, but comparable to the information that we're trying to extract. But anyway, it, it's an open problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But thanks, Adrian and Bill. Yeah. Sure. So there, there's two. Um, there's two more points I want to make. Let me. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna. I'm going to skip through the second one. Just uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, skim through the slides of this third method. So um, there was beautiful work. I just loved it. Uh, that was done by uh, Andreas Felton and Diego Guterres and other collaborators of um, basically uh, using modulated light to look at non light of sight imaging. And it's just so clever. It's one of my favorite, one of my favorite papers, really. Um, where you you get to have the reflection effects of the uh, conventional diffuse reflection, but uh, in in their work they modulated a laser to create a sort of synthetic wave, and the beauty of it is the synthetic wave interacts with the surface according to the wavelength of the modulation, not according to the wavelength of the fundamental uh, baseband light. And so you can make uh, a surface that is rough to the actual light wavelength appear smooth to the modulation wavelength because the modulation is so much larger. And then it, it's it's a kind of a, you you then what you look at is you, as at the receiver end you you don't look for the raw intensity changes because those are reflected according to the diffuse reflection, but you look at the strength of the modulation changes. Uh, and it's a really cute idea, um, and so I'm going to skip through the slides. I, I again, for here, that I, I wanted to apply it to the moon. So the question is, can you do it not with lasers but with sunlight? Is there enough modulation in the sunlight that you can use that to measure uh, something where you look at the look at the reflection from the wavelength of these modulations? And these modulations could make the moon as rough as it is. It could make it appear like a shiny ball. And then you just get to pretend it's a mirror and just look at the image that way. That's that was my hope. So what is this? So it hasn't worked yet. That's the bottom line. And the spinoff is the spinoff is to force me to work through all this stuff. I, I I couldn't have worked through it otherwise. But I I think I understand this stuff now, uh, and and that's been the benefit to me. Um, and um, again, I, I don't have time to skip through this. One of my collaborators is Jeff Shapiro, who's also worked on this um, modulation imaging, and he said, you know, Bill. What I want to do, sorry, back up. What I want to do is take a very short length exposure, like one thirty-two thousandth of a second, with a conventional camera, and look at changes in the intensities measured by that very short exposure as a way of measuring the modulations from sunlight. And Jeff's a theoretician. He said, "Bill, there's no way it's going to work. You're, you're the the magnitude of the modulation you're looking for is going to be down one part in a million. No way." 
So if you tell me no way, of course, I'm going to try it. <laughs> so I tried it. I got these narrow band filters, which are going to help make it work. And I got my, I bought a camera with a really short exposure, and I took these pictures. And so here's, here's 3,000 images of the moon, all registered with each other, all short exposures. My hope was that um, this modulation would be something I could use to measure basically a specular reflection from the moon from this cute trick uh, pioneered by the Wisconsin and Saragossa collaboration. Um, and I should point out here, this is not looking at the dark side of the moon. This is looking at the bright side of the moon. So just as a, as a first step, I was thinking, if I could see the sun in the moon, if I could see a specular reflection of the sun, I'd be really happy. So I was looking for the specular reflection of the sun. And uh, so I took all these images, did an SVD on them, and looked for um, some coordinated oscillations where the specular reflection of the sun was, was, was uh, all oscillating together. But I never found it. That's anyway. That's that's all I wanted to say there. Um, and so that's that's where I am with method number three. I haven't haven't been able to exploit variations in sunlight. Um, okay. So where are we with the three methods? Diffuse reflections, and we're off by about a factor of five or ten in resolution. Cast shadows, verse shine, about the same thing, about a factor of five. Uh, specular reflections of these P waves or these modulation waves. I haven't observed it yet in sunlight, but each one of these has led to spin-offs that have been valuable to me as a researcher. And so, um, oh yeah, I, I wanted to say when I would talk about this project with my department head, I would call it the dark side of tenure, because and and that bothered him so much. But uh, he he hated the idea that there might be a dark side to tenure. But in some sense, this moon project is the dark side of tenure because there's no reason to do it really. It's just for fun. But actually, looking at all these spin-offs, I think of it as the bright side of tenure. It's really what we're, you know, there's no other institution that's going to believe in you for 10 years and say, yeah, go ahead, go look at it, do whatever you want, you know, and, and let you follow your nose for so long. And and indeed, there's value to it. You know, it, it leads to all these research directions. So, so I wanted to make that point. And then if I can just um, go maybe five minutes longer, I want to tell you about the new direction I want to go. Um, and that is to use a super a computational, sort of more of a computational method. So before we've used these kind of weak priors, what would happen if you allowed yourself to use a whole library of Earth images from space as a, as a kind of supercharged prior on what you think your image should look like? Would that help you then reconstruct a good image just from this wisp of, of likelihood functions, very, very weak data you get from your observations? Well, we can try that. So um, it turns out there's this uh, satellite called Discover, which is um, put into space and the Lagrange 1 point, the, the L1 point, and that's between the Earth and the Sun. The gravitational forces between the two balance each other, and it's making a little elliptical orbit around this point that's even outside of the orbit of the Moon. And it gets pictures of the Earth. It's been doing it for five years. It takes them every hour or so. And there are these high-res pictures of the Earth from space. Um, here's one where the moon just happens to get in the way. So I thought it's interesting. You can see all the players involved here. Here's what the images look like from this satellite. Now you have five years worth of pictures like this to get a really, really strong prior of what the Earth from space really does look like. And you might imagine simulating this kind of a reconstruction that you have um, First, you have three different types of reconstruction from your lunar data. On uh, the far left, you'd have what you call a Gauss reconstruction, just the, you know, take the data and make these weak assumptions from our Gaussian model of what the Earth was, and you get this really fuzzy image like shown there. But you could imagine using the very, very weak lunar data to drive a, you know, GAN, uh, you know, generative adversarial network to that's been trained on earth images from space to see what is the most probable earth image from space that's consistent with this very weak data you have from your observations and i think of that as the sherlock holmes model like sherlock is is a great detective he looks at the moon data and says how is that consistent with the earth observations and so forth and then you can imagine uh this is a really subtle point i apologize for this but 
turns out Sherlock Holmes had an older brother named Mycroft. And Mycroft was just like Sherlock, really smart, but he was lazy. So the Mycroft reconstruction is he doesn't even bother taking the telescope outside. He just uses the Earth observations to make a prediction of what the Earth looks like now. So you can have two different high-res reconstructions, the one using the, the lunar observations and one not using them. And so you get this kind of Venn diagram of possible Earth reconstructions. The middle and left use the data from the telescope and the middle and right use the data from the Earth observations from, from space, and you have these different classes of reconstruction. So um, I'm eager to see how much with the current you know, nonlinear neural network reconstructions, how much you can get out of this very, very weak observation data that I've been talking about. And so that's another direction I'd like to go. Um, um, but, yeah. So I have one one point that I wanted to make. Um, so I'm, one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about the the second approach, um, you know, where you were looking at the five by five images of the moon, um, it's just that it's just that a similar approach has been used for um, in forensics, right, where they try to simulate um, the real picture uh, in the five by five form. So you have like a A to B, you know, where the the real picture looks like the Sherlock picture that you have or like the ground truth data driven yeah. picture and then you run it through your simulator to generate the five by five and then you have in addition to this data set here you have a data set of just um, a number of pictures that are in the original form and as they would be viewed from the telescope so that's I guess another um, another way of thinking about going from one uh, from the blurred image to the uh, Deconstruction. Um, okay. Okay. I, I, uh, I, I think that's yeah. I think that's similar to the simulations I had in mind. Um, anyway, I, I covered this last part really quickly. But let me just go back to here. I guess just to, as the last, final slide, um, summarizing the diff three different experimental approaches that we've done so far. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone. Um, and uh, I can take more questions now. Uh, maybe I'll also uh, put down the slides and let me look at your pictures, which makes it easier for me. Um, Thank you, Bill. Thanks very much. Um, okay, I, I would maybe... So I, I hope you see now why I, I said that Bill is one of my favorite researchers in the world. Uh, the, uh, he constantly teaches us to think big to tackle difficult problems and even if you don't completely succeed in your greater goal there are what he called spin-offs that yes yeah, spun off those greater ideas so that's uh, I, I i like to paraphrase um kennedy when he said we should uh tackle problems because are hard not because they are easy right mm. uh, and that's one of the things that that bill teaches us and I will copy the links of two projects that he worked on, how to recover sound from video and the accidental cameras. Uh, those were two of my favorite projects, uh, seven years old and maybe a bit older than the second one. So I hope you can check them out. And Julio, you can maybe copy the links in YouTube for the people in, in YouTube. So thank you, Bill. Uh, is there any questions. Please check out the links. They are super cool projects. So yeah, um, thanks Bill for the talk. It's super inspiring and, and it's great. Yeah, as Bill said, it's great to see how, yeah, thinking of something that might not be useful <laughs> becomes something that it's very, 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 very useful. Uh, like the corner camera, it's very, very uh, cool. So I've, I I heard of it, yeah, when in these reveal meetings, and I always wonder, um, so, and it's more or less related with Diego's uh, link to the accidental camera. So how much of the idea of this corner camera comes from the idea of the, of the accidental pinhole camera, right? 
because I, I've always seen like very, very related in the end, it's creating kind of a half pin holder that is creating some high frequencies and you can exploit these high frequencies to do something. So yeah, yeah totally. Uh, right. So um, the right, if you if you have no occluder, it's really hard to get a high resolution image out. But if you have some occluder that, that, as you said, introduces high frequencies into this uh, light transport matrix, then there is hope of getting out the recovering the original image. What you want to have is some some mechanism that that lets you distinguish the result of rays coming from one angle versus from another angle, and uh, and this corner is is one of the things that lets you do that. And I guess if you were having something like random, like a foliage or something, that would create some like a mask for like compressive sensing things. Yeah. Here, or? Yeah. So we we actually have um, that was one of our spin-off papers. Really. Um, let's see. Right. Um, so if uh, I see, yeah, I'm still sharing. I guess so. The bottom left. Um, also by a, by a Spanish first author, I should mention, um, uh, was inferring actual light fields from having a plant and and looking at the at the sh at the faint shadows from the plant. Um, you have to, it has to be it has to be a calibrated plant. <laughs> so we uh, used a uh, a plastic plant and and you know measured what the response was to a point of light at all these different positions in space. But um, once you have that, you can you can actually reconstruct a a, uh, a light field from from observations of the shadows. So yes, I, I agree. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, again for for yeah for the talk. It's, it's super super cool. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Um, Carlos has his hand. Thanks, for the talk. It was amazing, and uh, maybe. This is a very specific question. I don't know, but uh, in the in the corner camera, when reading the data from the floor, uh, it is it looks like the the data is captured with a regular camera. And but is it easy to disambiguate the noise uh, captured from the camera with the actual caster shadows? I I don't actually know if there is some noise, and you don't know if the, the noise comes from the camera or is actual status because intensity varies very lot, as you have said before. Yeah. So we do. Um, yeah. So the, uh, if I understand the question, it's about really how do we handle with the noise that you would get from a conventional camera. Um, so yes, there is noise, and we do have to worry about it. So um, we get to average over. We we're allowed to average over two different domains. One is we can average over um, over space and and average these these pie shaped averages of of, of spatial intensities because um, all the different positions on a on one of those pie shaped things receives the same intensity from the scene. We can average over them. We can also average over time, and so we take many photographs and uh, average in that direction also. Uh, I mean, not 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 too many because that gives you a blurred temporal resolution. But we're, but we're we're allowed to average over both domains. And that's what allows us to to measure this one part in a thousand signal, even though the camera just digitizes the information to one part in two fifty six typically. Uh, but but by taking these averages, you can you can get the higher uh, dynamic range resolution that you need. Thank you. Yeah. I have another question. If I sure. Ask. Okay. So uh, it's about the. Uh, looking around the corners and so on. I think that, I mean, of course, you mentioned that you can estimate the speed of the person walking behind the corner. Mm -hmm. right. I guess that you can also um, get the direction or if they are turning because the 1D signal gets narrower. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any other actions or activities that you could detect or that you could get? Yeah, no. That's a great question, and it's a direction I've wanted to explore, but I haven't, um, I haven't found a student who's interested in exploring it. But you can imagine a whole little tiny subfield of one-dimensional computer vision. You know what? What can you infer about human human action from a 
uh, you know, just you could you, you don't need a corner camera to do it. You can just take an ordinary video and average it vertically, and that's your signal. And from that signal as a function of time, what can you learn about the image? And so yes, you can. You, as you said, you can turn. You can decide if they're moving closer or farther from the camera. You can tell if they're um, walking in a circle. But there, I, I, I suspect that if you really tried hard at it, you could even come up with other activities that you might recognize from these 1D video traces. Like maybe you could tell if they were walking or running, or maybe you could tell if they were um, jumping up and down. Maybe that would leave some signal that you could identify. I don't know, but it would be, it would be fun just conceptually. It wouldn't be that useful, but it would be fun to explore what is the world of computer vision for a 1D camera. Uh, OK, thank you. Yeah. And a, a key part of his answer was, I haven't found a student yet. So that yes. may be one of you. <laughs> so if any of you is interested, you know, don't be shy. I mean, not right now, but, but these things work like this, right? You yeah, have interest totally. in working about something, and there's a professor looking for somebody to work with. There's a connection. That's how it goes, OK? Um, yeah. So do, uh, regarding this, uh, do you think a, a data-driven method would be useful if, if you try to learn about these things by having a lot of people jump and then go back and forth and then left and right and so on? Yeah, I think so. I, I think yeah. so. And, and I should say also, yeah, um, we've also explored um, removing, the corner, removing the corner and just looking at a blank wall and have someone acting in front of it. And you know it's 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 just horrible. Um, the data term is just so weak, but it's still surprisingly strong enough that you can pull out a small set of activities that they're doing. So um, so yes, I think I think you know supervised training based approach could yeah. lead to good results. Hmm. Any more questions, Julio? If you have something on YouTube or somebody else here, they will have. Take a break. Oh, there's a raised hand. Somebody, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I have a question. Uh, maybe complaining the um, uh, the question David said. Uh, could you extract any information, even if the illumination, uh, even if there are some illumination changes in the scene? Right. So, um, so I assume you're you're we're supposed to, I assume you're, the question is about the corner camera. Still, is that right? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it makes it harder. So the you know the assumption that we're making is that the only thing moving is is the is the person near the corner, and so if there's uh, illumination changes going on that are that are very quick, they would it would somewhat mess things up. But I should say the um, the method's fairly robust against long term changes. We took some data, which by chance during when it started to rain. And so, so there were you know, drops of water on the ground, and we were recording from it. And it failed. We were pleased. It failed in a graceful way. Uh, you, could, you, know, see the, you could still see the traces, but then they were corrupted by uh, these streaks that came from the water violating our assumptions. But, but um, as long as the illumination changes were slow over time, I think the method would be fairly robust against them. Anything else? OK, I don't see any hands raised. OK. Well, this Sorry. is great. Been a great audience. I love the participation. Thank you. And um, you know, next time in Zaragoza. <laughs> yeah, uh, please. Yeah, let's hope COVID goes away sometime soon. All right, so thank you very much, Bill. It was an honor, a uh, pleasure to have you here. And yeah, hopefully next time we'll chat face thank to face. You, and I want to see you in Boston too. Yeah, it will happen. Thank you again. Very exciting for the people in the audience. Again, please check the two links that I added. Um, and um, yeah, I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, and thanks, everybody. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Right. Thanks. Good night.